Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. So I welcome everybody on behalf of Jungle Girl Abuja and welcome to the ver first virtual um, events or workshop, rather for the year 2022. I hope we're all excited to be here. Um, yeah. Before we start, I would like to introduce some of our wonderful organizers. We can't be here without them. Um, the first person I'm going to introduce, which is the lead organizer, is Mr. Mayo Kun. Adilti is one of our, is the lead organizer and is a very wonderful person. I'm sure you've met him or seen him on the group, say one or two. Then I would also like to introduce Mr. Um, Williams Onaji. He's also one of our organizers, a wonderful, wonderful person and our wonderful coach, Mr. Namdi. Now, Jumbo Girls, uh, focus mainly on women because they want to bring more women to the world of technology. We want to make women more at the top. As we all know, technology is what is in town now, like what is bringing money you get. So, and that's what we are trying to do here. So at the end of this program, you'll be able to create your own website. You create your own website. You'll be a guru and a pro on your own. And <clears throat> before the end of this workshop, you'll be able to build your own Django app and get all the ideas you need. I hope this workshop is going to be a good value for your time, everyone. Um, Without further ado, let's start. Well, um, this workshop to, for today's section is going to be divided into two. So for these two hours, we are going to split it into two. First off, we are going to have the installation of how, how the internet works. And that's going to be taken by our wonderful I don't I Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yeah, can hear you. Yeah. So without further ado, let's 
be excited and welcome our first coach for the day to take us in installation and how the coach Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Ayodele Arosiola. And most people know me as Leon. That's part of my name also. So uh, I won't be taking much of your time because I'm at a conference. So I just have to go some time to talk to you people. So uh, let me, because so you'll be seeing people running back uh, behind me. So I'll turn my camera. So uh, let me oh, share my fun. screen so we can get started. Okay. Hmm. Fantastic. What's up with the better? Dango girls, Abuja 2022. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about installation and how the internet works. So, hope you can see my screen. Um, yes, really awesome. So, I will start with internet. And my name is Ayodele Arosiel, as I've said. I am an instructor on LinkedIn, I'm a project manager. I'm a community developer and founder of Worker in Abuja. So let's move forward. Now, let's, uh, let me use this as an explanation about the internet. Now, if you are sending an email to your friend or you're chatting with somebody, now it goes beyond your device. I mean, the receiver and the sender sending this um, email or chatting, maybe on WhatsApp. There are lots of computers under it that are bridging the gap of what you are doing. And most of the time, we call them servers that handles the communication channel between yourself and who you are sending messages to. Now, all this computer brings in together, we now refer to them as internet. But we can talk about internet without talking about network. And a network is a collection of connected computers that communicate with one another, which means if we have two or more computers in the same place, for as long as them can communicate to others, sharing files with one another and can communicate, both in and out, it means that a network has been existed and it has been established. Now, internet, we cannot break the world into two, inter and net, which means interconnection of networks. So if you look at what I have on the screen, I, I said it is the connection of distributed network system. So that brings many machines together so that they can communicate, send and receive data in the proper manner. Now, when we talk about proper, it means that we have another improper way of communication. But on the internet, we have a proper way of communication because there are some protocols that you need to follow for all these communications to go very well. Now, how does it work? Okay, yeah, there are two major functions or concepts behind the internet. The first one is the packet. And um, second one is the protocol. Now, packet is the uh, information that you are sending. So the packet holds whatever you are sending, either image, either text, either document, it holds the information that you are sending and find a route to send that information to. So, okay. So the next one is protocol. Uh, like I said, I said the internet works on based on two major concepts, which is packet and protocol. Now, packet holds the information, while protocol is the layer, or let me say the infrastructure that helps you send your information from one machine the, to the other. So like I said, I said one of the key obstacles that the internet developer had to overcome is connecting two machines. So the protocol has helped us to solve this problem by connecting these two machines together or thousands of machines together. Now, if you look at uh, Twitter, Instagram, you can see that if you make a tweet, thousands of people can see what you are tweeting about or what you are talking about. So that has, that has become very easy, very fast and seamless with the help of infrastructure that is working underneath the device you are holding. So uh, let me just talk about this uh, three key things that I have in my front. I said the first one is the physical infrastructure. 
So many of us might be seeing these things for the first time. We have routers, we have switches, and we have web servers. Now, let me first explain switch. Switches helps you to connect your computers together in a network. While the router connects switches together, then the web servers are the ones that are responsible for serving your files over the internet. So we have many physical infrastructure. There are the cables that connect all these things together, but the devices that I can just mention are just these three so that we won't have more time to talk about all this because it is a topic on its own. Each of these devices are topic on their own. Now, if you look at these terminologies, we have TCP, that is the transmission control protocol and the IP, which is the internet protocol. We have the DNS, the domain name system, we have TCP, we have TLS. Now, all these things are like handshake, they are like protocols, they are like uh, infrastructure that helps the communication on the internet possible. So, uh, for instance, if you look at um, www.djangogirlsabuja.com, that is a URL, and uh, it is a domain. Okay, Django is the domain, the World Wide Web in front, and the hosting at the back brings it together, the form a URL that you use. But if you type that on your browser and click enter, automatically the, your client, which is the browser, converts that naming to IP that the server understands and gets you the file that you request for. So if you say, I want to visit um, Django Gasaboja website, once you type that address, you are requesting for a file on the internet. So you don't need to know how it works, but automatically it brings out the information you requested for, for, uh, for you. Now, the third one is the future of internet. Now we are hearing of web three, web two. These are things that are now coming. So the future of internet, I don't think I can be able to talk about this now. So let's go to installation. And um, so uh, I will have to share my entire computer system. So we'll go through the installation uh, process step by step. Please, am I too fast? Hello. Yeah, not too fast though. Okay, thank you. So uh, we want to go into installation. So how many of us are using uh, Windows here? How many of us are using Windows? Or are we all on Windows? So that I, I know that we are all together because we have different operating system. We have Windows, Linux, and Mac. So because for this tutorial or for this uh, lesson, I'll be using Windows so that we can be together. Okay, fine. Somebody is using Windows. So I don't I'm have using anything. Windows. Awesome. I'm using awesome. Windows. I'm using Windows. Perfect. Perfect. It seems the majority is using Windows, so we can get started. So I'm also on Windows, so that I, I should maybe to switch to another uh, operating system. Okay, find that we are all using Windows. So now we have to start with um, installing Python on our system. So let me let me share my screen. Take this Good afternoon, ma'am. Yes, ma Sadiq, how are you? Good. How was school today? Good. Wow. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. I won't be sure if everybody. Okay. Can everybody see my system? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm on the desktop now. So I want to be sure we can see the desktop. Can you see my desktop? Yes, we can. Awesome. So the first thing is to install Python on our Windows machine. So uh, just open your browser. So let me use this. And just go to Python. You can just type Python and it will load Python page for you. Or you go to python.org 
forward slash download, then forward slash windows because we're using a Windows operating system. So that should load and we will download Python on our system, then install. So my system is a 64 bit. So we want to install Python 3 because you'll be using Python 3 for the rest of these uh, lessons so that we won't be having a clash of operating system. Now you will see that we have different things on the Python platform, but what we need to install is just the Python on its own. So I will click on the first one here, which says latest Python 3. Now we are here to download it. So Windows installer, let's use this. 64 bits. If your system is uh, 32 bits, you install this first one. But since my system is 64 bits, I'm using this. So just in case, don't be confused about the bit bit. Now, these bits are the architecture on which your system is being built on. So if your system is built on a 64 bit architecture, it can handle all 64 and 32 bits uh, program, uh, programs. But if your system is 32 bit, it can only handle 32 bit uh, architecture softwares. So once you've downloaded, you click, since it's a window, it opens up and we follow the installation prompt. So this is what you should see. So I want to add it to the part also so that we won't be adding to the part later on so that it will be easier for us. So install launcher for all users, then install now. Click on yes, then the installation progress, uh, progress will start. So uh, from now on, you can just be clicking yes and check what is asking you to click for yes. So it is not an Android that will be asking you to access your calendar. So it's just your system resources that it will be asking you permission for it to access. So it will install all what is necessary for the Python to run. So when the installation completes, you also see a successful message that tells you that, okay, this uh, program that you are installing has installed successfully. So uh, let's wait for it to install. It shouldn't take much time. Um, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit fast. So after we install Python, we also install a code editor. So a code editor is, uh, helps us to write our code. So uh, we have different code editor. We have Visual Studio Code. I have it installed already. We have gedit. We have Sublime Text. We have Atom. My favorite one is Visual Studio Code. So you can choose the one that you like. I've used Sublime Text. I've used Atom. Uh, I've used some other ones. OK. It says so setup was successful. Now we can close. So um, let's test if our code uh, was installed successfully. Let's open our terminal um, CMD prompt. Okay. Uh, let's see if it will work. Yeah, so let's type Python. It tells us that we install Python 3, copyright, credit. It means that we've successfully installed. So I can do 2 plus 2, return 4. So exit. OK. So it means that we successfully install Python on our Windows machine, and we can close our, text, uh, our command line. Now, Moving forward, we need to install a text editor. So if you want to install, uh, I need to move this up. I mean, this thing is covering my screen. This, okay. All right, so, uh, to install Visual Studio Code, just type VS Code on your browser. So it will bring you to this place. Just click on download and download. And if you want uh, 
G edit put on your browser, it will bring it up. Just click on it, download and install. Just the same way you install. Okay, you can see it here. So uh, and if it is um, Atom, just type on the browser, just search um, Atom download. Okay, so click on it and download for Windows. So I have my own Visual Studio code down already, so I won't be going through that process. But once you click on download and it is done, and it is done install it the same way you install your Python and it will be like this. If you're installing VS Code, this is how VS Code looks like. So this is what it looks like, Visual Studio Code. I don't know why my system is hanging. Yeah, so this is the logo for Visual Studio Code. And if you click on it to launch, this is how it looks like. Yeah, so sorry about this. I've been writing some nonsense things on my screen before. So this is how it looks like you have this environment for writing your own code. Yeah, so the next application we'll be installing aside the code editor is um, virtual end and then install Django. Now, the virtual environment, which we can also call virtual end, um, is an environment that is needed when working with Django. So we need to set it up so that we can have a uh, a swift, or let me say a smooth running with our Django applications while running it. So we need to make a directory on our machine so that whenever we are building, it can be using that directory that we've pointed it to for it. On your command line, Uh, let me check this. It's not for you to look for any directory you want. You can put it on your desktop, in your C drive, which is the main directory of your system, your, your local disk. So just find a place to put it. So let's say you want to put it on the desktop. And you can also use your Let's start learning how to use CMD from this stage. So now on your CMD, there are some commands that you can not on line of command. CMS. Let's do it nice. KMC. Next to you. Well, I feel what I'm doing. Oh, guess. Okay. So now I make a directory in my C. Pro 11. Now, if I should open my C drive, that is my local disk, I will see a folder called users. And in that folder, I will also see Windows Pro 11. Let's see. So that we'll be sure that what we are doing is correct. So the first thing is C drive. Then you can see we have users. You also see this folder. Now you see Django girls, correct? You can see. So it is just like you create a folder that is many of that MKDR that I wrote on the command line. So it's just to make a directory for us. So let's go back to the CMD. So now we want to change our directory to this Django girl. So we want to leave the root folder of this window pro 11 and go to the Django girls. So Django. So now, currently, we are now in the folder of Django Girls. So we can see that in our C drive, we move to the folder of users, then to the folder of Win Pro 11, then the folder we created to as a directory, which is Django Girls. So this is where we will create our uh, virtual environment. So, 
Let's just do this command. Then the name of our virtual environment, if I say VN, then my V E N V. So that is in this folder, I want to create my virtual environment in this place. So you can use other name. It will make it uh, lower case so that it will be easier for your system to process. So, and it's also a good idea to just use a short name like Leon, because this is what you're referencing every time you are working with your Django uh, application. So, click enter. So, it will create the virtual environment for us and will be good. Let's just wait for it. Uh, that is for virtual environments. Now, working with virtual environments. So, the command we entered before is to create a directory. Now, the next command was to create a virtual environment inside the directory we created. So inside the directory now, we have created a virtual environment for our application to run on. So I don't know, if you're working on Windows 10, you might be having an error that your, uh, what's it called? That your command cannot be created or so, but it's not something you have to worry about. It is just that your PowerShell has, uh, has disabled you from performing such activities, which can also disable. Maybe in the group chat on WhatsApp, if you have any issue, we can quickly solve that with you. So you can continue with your project. So uh, once that we create our virtual environment, should we do a small task to see if our virtual environment is running? Um, but because of our time, let's quickly go to installing Django. Because since we have our virtual environment started, we cannot install Django. Now, um, let's go with uh, C. Python. Store. I don't know if this is going to work for me in this one. Let's see. Upgrade. For Mac. Only we try connect known with known solution. Network is in an issue. Let's try again. Awesome. My network is unstable for the other time. That was why it wasn't able to install. So now we've installed PIP. So um, PIP is like a package that you need in Python so that you can be able to run Django. So you, you need to have the latest PIP uh let me see, let me call it framework for us to use the django now okay um see let's try this quick stuff you will give an Okay, now the rule is for us to create a requirement text inside our folder here, the Django Girls folder. Now we can see that my environment folder is here, so it handles all what we uh, all what we need. So let's create a requirement. Please keep your question to the end of the um, session. 
Okay, let's create a new folder. No, we don't need a folder. We just need to create a text file. Skip. Please delete this. Sorry, we are creating a text document, not. Yeah. So let's call it requirements. Requirements. Dot txt. So uh, this will undo all our dependencies that we need for our Django application. Okay, so now let's open this file in our text editor. Open its code. So in, in this code, just add the following text on it. Django. This, the symbol I type is at the top of your tab under your three, point two, point one zero. This is the version. Okay, so save this. Now you can also run your command here in your uh, in your terminal. I mean in your code editor because we just still could come with a terminal that you can use to run any command instead of you switching between your command prompt and your Visual Studio code. So you can quickly just open a terminal here as you are working in your. Um, with your project. So you don't need to be switching between your command lines. So I just need to change my directory back to the Django girls. So CD means change directory, Django girls. Now I'm in that directory. So we just do pip install because we've already installed pip already. So that is what we'll be using to install all what we need to do. So just do pip install, then I can arm, that is requirements, .txt, so it will install Django 3.2.10 for us. So let's run this. Wow, it says no software directory. Django girls. Are we sure? I'm coming. Let's check it again. Yeah, we have comments.txt. Why is it not running? Oh, 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 come back. We need to rename this um, coming. Let's go back to our file because it is giving it double name. That's why we are getting error. So we have to rename it again. Okay. It's already a text document, so we shouldn't give it that double name. Who knows why we are getting that error? Because it's it was specified as a, okay, let's open it again. I said create a text document, but I now give it another uh, extension .txt, which means it is nullifying the extension that it has already. So let's check again. Perfect. We have the requirement .txt that we need, so we are not having double .txt .txt. So now let's run the command again and let's see if it will work. So again, we have to change our directory back to. Django girls, because that is where we are working. Awesome. So now install Django, you do pip. I think R, the requirements. Requirements.txt to install Django. Okay. 
Sorry, as an omission, install. Okay, so let's see again. Let's go again. Perfect. So it is now installing Django for us. So uh, we have different errors. And um, the first error we had was because we, we, we named the file uh, separately. And then also another error we encountered was because I did not include install in my command. So now that we have it to work perfectly, now we have perfectly installed Django on our Windows machine. So once this is once this installed successfully, the next thing we need to install is Git. Next thing we need to install is Git. So uh, as you are working on your project, there's a need for you to keep a reference of your project virtually also. So you will only have your files locally. You can also have them virtually so that more people can work on the same project at the same time. So using GitHub, so to install Git on your system, like Git is a, uh, is a language for versioning. So you know, on every application, you might have version one, version two, so it, it takes you to keep, uh, to, to keep track of your progress and give version to your applications. So if we install Django, the next thing for us to install is Git. So for us to, to install Git, just go back to your browser and click on your address bar and just type git scm dot com to download. Although I, I have it installed on my system already, so you are here. Just click on download for Windows. Once it has downloaded, it will, it will download an executable files for you. Click on it after downloading and follow the steps. Just click on yes and to install on your system. Just the way we store um, Python. Once you download the executable file, you install the Git application. So the next thing for you to create a GitHub account, just go to github.com. So github.com is like a platform. Where you can uh, to version your the new at uh, the learning page of Git. Yeah, so this is how it looks like when you get to github.com. So you click on sign up and follow the process of the signing up uh, process. So sign up and you will learn how to use it in the uh, in the future tutorials. So the last account that we will create, sorry for still asking you. So the account, the last account we will create is Python anywhere. So just go to www.python Python uh, anywhere Python anywhere dot com. Anywhere.com. So, Python Anywhere is like a platform where you can write your Python code on the cloud. You write it and you save. So, it gives you a writing environment where you, where you can write, deploy, and run your Python. Uh, language on the cloud. So come here and sign up. So you are signing up for beginner, which is free. Put the account here as a beginner for free. Uh, my network. So username, my username is always Liam of Things. And my email. 
a password So this will create an account for me. So I, I don't need to subscribe. So I will not be taking the tour. You can take the tour when, when you are new here. So you can see these are things you can use. This for data science, let's say, Jupyter notebooks, you can have it here. You can see. So this is an environment for you to create your Python. And you can see this is your bash, this is your Python. So we click and let's use 3.9 to create uh, a console for you where you can write your Python language and you can run on the cloud. So uh, we've come to the end of installation. So I still have something for you. So I said, learning, learning never ex exhausts the mind. That is for the things we have to learn, before we can do them, we learn by doing them. So this is the beginning of a journey to start a new, uh, to, to get a new knowledge. So give your all to learn and make sure you just don't learn. You practice what you have learned. So what you've learned today, practice them and do them again. So thank you for listening. Uh, my name is Ayodele. Uh, thank you for following up with the, uh, with the class all along. So any other thing that I need to know or that I need to give a request on, so I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, hello, so we've come to the end of my session. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Leon. That was a very wonderful section we had. And I'm sure we are all, like we all had value for our time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> yeah. Everyone, I hope this class was fun and we learned a lot. Um, sorry about those complaining about um, the network. Everyone, I hope we are still learning because we are about to bring up another wonderful coach who is going to take us in Python, virtual environments and data types by Emmanuel and Nebi. So stay tuned and please be with your system. The more the coaches talk, whatever they say, try to do it. The more you do it, the more um, you practice, the more you get more knowledge, the more you get more understanding. If you just keep on listening and listening and listening, you may not really remember, but if you do it and you are seeing it and you are doing it with your own system, you actually, you know, it will stick. Because I was once a student as well, 2017, Django Girls. And as I then, what helped me was with my system, although it was physical, it's not virtual. But I know we can still learn and do better. So without too much blabbing and too much talk, do we have um, Mr. Emmanuel, Coach Emmanuel Anibi? Yeah, hello. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Okay. So um, it's nice to be here. I don't know if you can all hear me. We can hear you. Okay. I can Thank hear you. you very well. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, I'm going to share my screen. And I would like to say, well, um, a great job to Mr. Leon, Mr. Dilly for presenting and taking us through that session. Uh, it was quite very enlightening and um, very educative too. I think I like the part where he talked about the internet. Uh, just to refresh my knowledge on that. Okay, so we we'll would be going on and progressing with from where Mr. Liam stopped. 
So, um, well, he's already taken part of my uh, part of what I was about to share with you, and um, that's the virtual environment part. So, anyways, it's a build up of knowledge. So, I don't think you all will be confused, but if you are, don't be. Um, just um, have, have your questions ready and I'll answer them. Thank you. Hope you all can see my screen. Yes, we can. All right. Thank you. I can see your screen. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll be continuing with um, where he stopped. Python. So I'll be introducing Python, uh, maybe giving a more better definition to what Python is. Okay, so, so Python is a so Python is a computer programming language. Uh, someone say something. All right. So Python is a computer programming language. Okay. Oh, foreign. Okay, it's just the learning, right? Okay, thank you. So Python is a computer programming language, uh, and is often used to build websites, software, automate automate tasks, and conduct data analysis. So that's a very simple definition to what Python is. But um, it keeps understanding it is what a programming language is. So take a programming language to be like a human language where we all speak English and um, other Nigerian languages. I think for me, I can speak Hausa, a little of Igwa Yoruba, is it greetings anyway? But um, I would like to relate a programming language to the human language. Well, um, especially with English. Well, the language helps you to communicate with other entities that understand the same language. So um, a computer programming language helps computers communicate with themselves, right? You can make a computer do something, or you can make a computer talk to another computer through the help of the programming language and things like APIs. Uh, in, in a human language, there are things that um, make it possible to understand meanings and entities like uh, names, right? So let's say my name is Emmanuel, there is Oluchi, and there is Deborah, you know, those are words, but when you hear those things, you know they identify a human being, right? So also in computer programming languages, there are names, but they have a different name called variables. So variables define entities to a computer programming language. In fact, they define entities to what a computer program would do. Yeah, so that's that's how I want to help you understand what a computer programming uh, language does. So just like in English, you have nouns and verbs. You also have things that look like that. Like I said, in English, there are names, which is a noun. In a computer programming language, there is a variable, right? And for a verb, which maybe means like run or is running, uh, there are computer programming entities that represent verbs like functions to do something. So it's something like that. So it's if you can understand the computer programming language as a language that um, tell that you use to instruct a computer first or use it to communicate with other computers it would help you understand what python is so let me go ahead by thinking so python is a computer programming language often used to build websites and software right to automate tasks and conduct data analysis now this is quite a whole lot because um it seems they are in different domains. Uh, well, we can relate websites and software, but what about automating tax? What kind of tax? Uh, what about conducting data analysis? I thought those are things for Excel. Well, 
it then goes further to say that Python is a general purpose language, meaning it can be used to create a variety of specific programs and isn't specialized for any specific problem. So you could see Python as a Swiss Army knife, right? It's more like um, a tool that can do many things. In, in that tool, there is a knife, there is a scissors, there is a, um, a screwdriver, there is a plier. So one tool that does many things. So that's what Python is. It's a general purpose programming language and it's easy to learn. Yeah, it's easy to learn. So there are things you can do with Python. Number one um, is um, doing general software development. You can use Python to do data science and math, and then you could speed up or automate your workflow, and you can use it to build embedded systems and robots. So you use Python also for programming robots and mechatronics generally. Okay, so Python isn't Python isn't um, how would I put it now? Maybe a small language. Python is used in these companies. So if you use any of these apps on your phone, if you watch Netflix or if you use Instagram, obviously Facebook, and you won't say you don't use Google. If you use any of these among others, you are using a program that was written in Python. So that's how powerful this programming language is. Thank you. Can I go on? If you have your questions, please note them down. I would answer. All right. Then, um, now, you've understood what Python is, and I've explained to you that um, uh, in a programming language, there, there are things that define entities and define what you can do with those entities in the language. So this is where data types come in. Now, data types, if I define or I read what's on my slide, I would say data type um, define what a name would be, right? If you hear the name Toyota, it, what comes to your mind is a car. If you hear ShopRite, what comes to your name, to your mind, sorry, is a supermarket or a mega store. If you hear um, Manchester United, you know it's a football club, right? So those things, even though they are abstract, but they are pointers to different things, even though they are names, they are pointers to different things. One points to a industry that manufactures cars, the other points to a multinational company and the other point to a football club. Now, though they are still names, they point to different things. The different things which they point to can be related to data types in Python or in programming languages in general. So in Python, numeric data type represents data that has numeric value. And a numeric value can be integer, a floating number, or a complex number. Now, what, what's the difference between an integer and a floating number is a floating number has a period and several other numbers after the very first number, meaning 3.14, which is the number for pi, is a floating number, while 10 is an integer. And then, what's a complex number? A complex number is a number that has both real and imaginary parts. So something like um, 3IG is a complex number. And you can use it. You can create complex numbers in Python. So um, these values, which is these data types, are defined as int, float, complex classes in Python. Don't get it confused, right? And int, obviously, is a sh should tell you it's for integer, a float tells you it's for a floating number, and complex classes uh, should tell you it's a complex number. 
right? And these aren't all the data types in Python. But if you understand this, you can understand the other data types in Python. Uh, and um, variables can store different types, and different types can do different things. So meaning that um, in programming or in Python, um, a variable can store Victor as a string, which for us humans would mean the name of someone, and variables can store one million, which for us could be the value of someone's bank account, and some other things like that. So if you could relate that understanding to data types, you would understand what data types are. So, sorry, who is saying something or come back? Uh, right, ABCD, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, Luchi, can you mute yourself? Yay. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, we're going to be doing some practicals so as you could understand that. But I think if you understand the basic, uh, if you have basic understanding of it, it will be very easy for you to understand the practical side. Okay, so, um, well, programming, it's like maths, but it's not maths, right? Uh, I think in maths, there's something called left-hand side and right-hand side. Okay, so in programming, um, whatever is at the left-hand side stores the value of what's at the right-hand side, especially if it's just one equal to that is separating the both. Let me repeat that again. So in programming, whatever is at the left hand side stores the value of whatever is at the right hand side, especially if what is separating them is just one equal two. So take example, a is equal to two. Well, in math you'd see a is equal to two, but in programming you see two is assigned to a, meaning a stores two. Let me take that again. In mathematics, you would say you would read this as a is equal to two, right? But in programming, you would read it as two is assigned to a, or meaning two is stored in a. Now, a is a variable and two is the data. Let me take that again. A is a variable which to us would mean a name. Like I said, um, Toyota is a name that points to a, an industry or a company that manufactures cars. Manchester United is a name that points to a football club. Anyways, in this case, A is a name that points to two. If you understand this, you will understand the foundations of programming because we could have a is 1000 meaning a stores 1000 you could have a is hmm, let me think of a name a is manual meaning a stores a string or stores obviously a name is a string right so what I mean in name is a string, Emmanuel is a string. So A stores a string, which is Emmanuel. Now, whatever is at the right hand side is the data, and whatever is at the left hand side is the variable. Then, I want to read this line that says, in Python, the data type, meaning the data type which could be an integer, a string, a floating point number, or a complex number, is set or is assigned or let me say is set when you assign a value to the variable and this is referred to as dynamic typing okay it's not typing when, uh, let's say you are typing on your keyboard no it's called since you have data type it means dynamic data typing meaning you are assigning a data type dynamically now there are 
so you could then see or you could infer that python is a dynamically typed programming language there are statically typed programming languages like java and um, c plus plus and all those object oriented languages meaning that you would have to clearly define what kind of data type that the variable would store so you see that it's very easy when you are using dynamic typing but you have to be very sure of what data you are storing because in python you could say a is equal to two and in the next line we say a is equal to string emmanuel python would not shout but you have to know why you are doing that because um, you may mix up things so that's why there are static statically typed programming languages like java that says if you define a to only store integers you cannot store string emmanuel in a you must create another variable to store emmanuel and that's what makes python interesting okay let me show you this um in my terminal here how all of you or oh, if someone can see this please just type i can see this uh i need a feedback if you can see this if it's clear enough if it's clear enough can someone just on it and see yes or something okay thanks ben. all right so i mean clear exit this all right let's get into python again so if i say a is two and i type a is it prints two here oh no let's uh, stop sharing sorry one minute let me share my screen totally okay sorry um thanks for that Okay, let's get into Python again. So if I say a is equal to no, not equal to if two is assigned to a, and I press enter, there's no error. But if I type a and press enter, it tells me two, meaning two is is what a carries. Right? I could say name, and this is how you define a string in Python: the double quotes. And I say smart. If I if I press enter, there's no error. But if I type name, you see it stores smart. This string tells you or this quotes here is single quotes. You could use either single or double quotes, but you can't use single and a double quotes together. So it tells you that name carries smart. So that's what um, a variable does in Python. It stores what you want to want it to store. And um, if you prefer, let's say balance is equal uh, not equal to is assigned um, one thousand. Like in the banks, they say one thousand naira only. The only part is the dot dot dot. You see, when it's the balance, it stores it as this. This is a floating point number. This is an integer, and this is a string. Now, we don't. We just have to type the name. We just set the value. That's what makes Python awesome because of the dynamic typing abilities. But you have to be careful how you use it. Okay. So let's go on. Um, all right. Going on. So dynamic typing in Python means the interpreter itself infers the type of the data that a variable receives without the need of the user. So meaning the interpreter, which is Python, or in this case, 
this is a Python interpreter. It infers the data type that it's going to store. That's what this statement means. Is it the interpreter itself infers the type of the data that the variable receives without the need of the user. So the Python I mean, Python interpreter knew that because this is a string, name stores a string, and because this is an integer, name stores an I mean a stores an integer which is two, and because this is a floating point number balance stores 1000.0 okay so now python has the following data types built in by default meaning these are some of the data types you can create your own data types that's when you get into advanced python object oriented programming so, um, now, when I said smart, smart is a string, meaning it's a data type. Two is an integer, and 1000 is a floating point. I, I needed to stress that before I proceed because text type. Oops. Text type is a string. Numeric types is an int, float, or a complex number for mathematical functions. Sequence type, there's a thing called a list. A list is more like um, a collection. Let's say you go to a supermarket, you are always given the opportunity to take a basket, and then you go around and you put in different sorts of things. You could buy groceries, you could buy um, juices, and um, confectionaries, cakes, all that. You could put all of them in one basket. If you if you picture that, you would understand what a list is. So a list is more like a collection of different data types. The list can allow you to store strings, floats, dictionaries, and all that. So that's what it means by sequence type. And there is not just only list. There is a tuple and a range so a range is more like from one to one thousand right all stored in one variable right it's more like how hard it would be to write one to one thousand with your pen and paper so it would it, it, it take you very let's say 10 minutes if you are a fast writer but you store all that in one variable let's say a if you do that means a sequence of numbers from 1 to 1000 are stored in a so that that's what a sequence is meaning um things you go from one to the other to the other until you get to the end then a mapping type is more like um, a dictionary this dict means dictionary now even in your dictionary your oxford dictionary where a word has a definition or has a meaning to it or it where they define or explain what the word is like um hunger right then hunger is a key and then the definition means once you are hungry or desires or let's say your belly is empty of food right so that definition is stored but what identifies that definition is the word hunger so that's what a mapping type is Simply put, is a dic an example is a dictionary. And then there are set types. The first one is a set, the second is a frozen set. Simply, a set helps you to store collections uniquely. In a list, you could put one, 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 five times. But in a set, you could only put one and then another unique type so that to avoid duplicates. And there's a boolean type. A boolean type is, is just two, true or false. So you need that. Um, if you are building a program or you are doing something that has to check or depends on the value, true or false, can this person withdraw 10,000 error? 
if you check the balance of his account and the balance is 9,950 naira, the response logically will be false, right? Because you can't withdraw 10,000 if your balance is 9,000. Let's say you don't do bank charges. If you do bank charges, it will be worse. <laughs> anyway, so in that situation, the response or the bullying type will be false. And if the person's balance is 10 million, you can tell him you can withdraw 10,000 and you know, dash me some. Anyways, so meaning the bullying type is true. So you could have true or false for bullying type and just those two. Then there are binary types, which are quite advanced types, which you need for streaming data and all that. Please note your questions if you have any questions. I'll make time available to answer. Okay, so let's see some examples and do some practicals. Now, practical example. Okay, so the first one, don't mind I'm using X all true. It could be X, Y, Z, A, B for the, for the examples and we will try them. So the first example is X is equal or X stores or X is assigned hello world. Now note the strings. You don't just type hello world. You have to put the put to ensure or to define it as a string. So X is or X is assigned a string hello world. That's now how do we know the data type? Obviously, if you see the double quote, you know it's a string. So X is of type string or a text type, like you've seen here, a text type. Then X is 20 or X is assigned 20 is a numeric type and specifically an int or an integer. X is stored 20.5 or X is assigned 20.5. You know, it's not just 20, but there's a 0.5. So it's, it's a numeric type, but it's not an integer, it's a float. And X is assigned an opening square bracket with different lists, or sorry, with different strings. Apple, banana, cherry. Now, if you said that the data type for X, if it's apple, banana in a square bracket, is a string, uh, you're wrong. It's not a string, even though it's a collection of strings. Now, note collection. It's not a string, but a collection of strings. And I said, sequence type called collections especially a list so it's a list of strings so you can say x is a list of strings or x is assigned a list of apple banana and cherry now before i say what the data type for the last one is i want you to look at it and tell me what it is is it a string or a boolean in the next 10 seconds think about it you could put the answer in the chat if you want. So is the last one, is X a string or a boolean? Okay, thank you, Adila. It's a boolean because it doesn't have the quotes around it. So it's a boolean not a string okay so let's welcome the type function and let's do some practice mm -hmm. okay so i'm gonna exit my interpreter clear my screen and again so there is a function called type right but let's do x is 20 and let us see the data type in X. You could use the type function. Now, the function is, like I said, a verb that does something. So a function that's, anyways, 
it's a, it's it's interesting but a function does something so the type function it has this opening and close bracket does something with what you give it right it's like um a blender a blender the function of a blender is to blend whatever you give it be it be it um, your fruit or whatever you give it it blends it so a type function checks the data type of whatever value you pass to it so if we pass x to type you get int it tells you that 20 is an integer okay let's try x or no let's try y is stored 20.5 what is the type of y It's a flute. So the data type for Y is the flute because of this extra part, which is the floating part of the number. Then let's try Z. Z is, um, what's that again? Z is hello world. Yeah. Let's go with hello world. And let's find the type or let's check the data type of oh, I used that I used X sorry okay let me use Z so that's hello world now just let me not go too far if you see we have X is 20 and Z is 20 X is hello world again now I said something about dynamic typing so let's use this situation to explain that now as a dynamic dynamically typed programming language it, it didn't raise an error it just accepted it it was like okay since you are changing x from being an integer to an integer which is 20 to hello world i will i will, I will change whatever is there in x to make it hello world now other programming languages that are statically typed would throw an error, but a dynamically typed language did not, like Python. And if you want to confirm, you could see that type X, when we did X is assigned 20, is an int. Let's do type X. You see, it's now a string. So that shows you the power of a programming language. Of a dynamically typed programming language so x is now a string initially it was an int now it's a string and that's what happens when you do type of z you get a string and then um, moving on to the next example is this guy a list of strings so a list is defined with first these two characters square brackets so a square bracket tells you, okay, if you look at it, it looks more like a basket or a collection or something where you can drop things inside. So you could put different types in a list. And interestingly, you could put a list inside a list. It's more like putting a basket inside a bigger basket. So if you put apple and now note the comma, this comma here means that okay there's apple and another thing and another thing so it could be banana or mango now x anyways I, I'm, I'm so used to x now that the program is not shouting remember it's a dynamically type language so if I said the type of X is a list, right? It tells you it's a list. It's then your choice to find, okay, it's a list. It's, it could be a list of anything, but just know that it's a list. If you want to know what are the data types of the individual item, you would then have to do this if you prefer. And it tells you that 
a type is a string, meaning the square bracket zero, meaning this first guy. Now let's not let's not go ahead of ourselves. But what I just did was I checked the data type of this guy. So I access the list by the index of the list. So the index of a list means um the position where a data is in the list. So if I do X, it brings me Apple. And why didn't it why didn't why did I have to start with zero? Well, the fundamental principle of computing is that everything in computing on your computer when the computer sees it is zero and one so humans count from one upward but the computer starts or counts zero and one that's why you have the word binary meaning just two numbers zero and one so we start from zero and then go up so if you want to see what is in x1 it should give you a banana so you would read this as the index of apple or the position of apple in the list x is zero and the position of banana in the list x is one and the position of mango is two so if you understand that you would understand how to use a list so that's that's what a list does because obviously if you are putting something to the basket the first one that came in takes position zero and then whatever comes in next takes position one and keeps incrementing until n n can be one million n can be ten so n is open to any integer number it cannot be 1.5 we get an error so it's always integers because list indexes must be integers not float thank you okay so let's move on but now i said if you look here we just assign we just define or we just say x is assigned hello and the data type is dynamically assigned to x right or if you do 20 the data type is dynamically assigned to x but if you want to specify the data type on your own like no i'm too strict and you you can use the constructor functions like i said a function is like a verb right it does something so a construction function does like what the construction company does it creates so if you're building construction it creates building so the construction functions of this data type are here the string the str the int the float the list the dict i didn't show you this data type of a dictionary let me say dictionary or oh, it's a reserved keyword let me say english dictionary and i want to create a dictionary now notice the difference in we didn't use a call we didn't use a square bracket this is a curly brace okay so i said hunger and the definition is um the absence of food it's not shaka the absence of stressing power anyways you can define that if you want so um let's say this is your english dictionary you are trying to define hunger is the key that points to this definition the absence of food let me complete it in the belly that's a very basic definition to hunger there can be hunger of, of different things so now the data type for english dictionary if you guess it is dict you are correct 
is called a class of type dict. Now, if you notice that int, float, string are what stand before this definition here, here, and here, meaning you could use lists to create your own lists you could use dict to create your own dictionary the way it is defined here that is str which stands for or which represents string then you put it in a bracket it means a constructor of string should create a string for you or an integer of or int, int open bracket 20 should create an integer of 20 for you of float 20.5 should create a float and store it in x or list whatever stores a list in x or a collection or a sequence in x now this is how you use um, construction functions constructor functions to create data and specify the data type now you can do this but this is discouraged because um unless you have a very or you have a reason to do that just go ahead to define the data type and let the interpreter define go ahead to define the data and let the interpreter def, infer the data type for you because doing this is can get quite difficult and allows room for mistakes unless you have a very strong reason to do this it is quite discouraged to do this there's a reason why this is there and it's called and it's there when you want to cast a data type meaning you want to forcefully or subtly rather change a data type from an integer to a string but it's highly discouraged too but it's I just needed you to let this, I just needed to let you know that you don't create data like this unless you have a strong reason or you want to change a data type from one to another without having to create it again. Okay, and um, let me just show you that it works, sure. Okay, so if we let me exit this is too much okay so if i say x is string again i said don't do this at home <laughs> unless you have a strong reason to do it there's no error and if you print x it still gives you hello world right there's no problem with it if you could go ahead to say y is int 20 or 2000 or 20,000 and print y, it still goes right. But here's a good reason why you want to do that. Now, maybe I want to cast z. I made a mistake and I said, yo, maybe I want to do a computation of someone's salary. And the salary is 200,000. So it's Oh, it's 2 million. Okay, the size is 2 million. And the data type, type Z, is a string. And I want to change that value to a number so that I could do something like um, 2 million minus 100,000. Okay, sorry, this 200,000 minus 100,000, it gives you 100,000. Let's say I want to do 2 million minus 1,000. I get 99 or 1.999 million, whatever. But I can't do that calculation on a string because it's like trying to say A minus 10. This isn't um, quadratic or all those... Um, mathematical things where you see x minus 10 is equal to y or something like that so you can do a string minus an integer so you want to change that string to an integer 
So since z is a string, sorry, since z, z here is a string, I want to cast z to an int. So let me say salary is equal to int, and I put z meaning I want to change or cast int, I mean string z to an int. So if I check salary, salary is now 200,000 and the type of salary is int. So that's a good use for that constructor function. So rather than it, me trying to do this, I could just do x is equal to double quotes, hello world, double quotes, close the quotes and I've created my string. And um, let's go back to our slides. Okay. Okay. So yeah, references, Django guest tutorials, and W Tracy schools. Thank you very much for your time and patience. I would love to take questions now, if any. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Emmanuel, for that wonderful section. I'm sure everybody has learned a lot. For everyone that can't ask their question now, the group is opened. They can feel free to ask any question, and I'm sure you'll be available for them. So thank you very much for this yeah, wonderful session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, everyone here, same time tomorrow, four to six. I'm sure we all had an amazing learning experience. Please, I don't want us to stop here. I want us to continue. The more you continue, you have more questions to ask. We have wonderful and amazing coaches here for you. So please let it continue. Even after now, you can take your laptops and just try one or two. Okay, peace, I didn't get it very well. Let me try it again. Before you know, you create more questions, you get more understanding, and you become great. There's always a little beginning to success stories. And if you put more effort in learning and trying on your own and practicing on your own, I am very, very certain that this is just the beginning to a great start. So thank you to everyone for attending. And again, I would say, if you have any questions, feel free to come on the group to ask. Your questions will be directed to the appropriate coaches and you'll get your answers. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.